Our speaker today, come on up, Catherine, is art teacher Catherine Hilden, who grew up on the north side of Chicago. Her very relevant topic is how the Bauhaus artists saw their innovative design concepts as a way to help form a more moral society. Catherine is an Evanston artist who teaches painting and drawing at the Evanston Art Center. Her class is titled, What Would Mondrian Do? We have all been enjoying her students' paintings on the walls of the community room. Catherine was awarded a scholarship to study at the Art Institute of Chicago. She also holds degrees in math and German and has also been a docent at the Chicago Architecture Foundation, giving both the Riverboat Tour and the Luke Skyscraper Tour. I'm sure we will all leave today with many images in our minds and a greater understanding of the relationship between artists and society. Welcome, Catherine. Well, here it is, Sunday morning, and we get to talk about art. Uh, actually, I'm not only talking about the Bauhaus, but also about Picasso. So there will be two parts to this. Um, both uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and public Picasso were born into stodgy Victorianism, uh, Picasso in 1881 and Mies in 1886. But they spent their youth in the cultural explosion of the years right around 1900. What microphone? You can't hear me? I sound so loud. Is this it right here? Oh, yes. OK. So you missed all of that? Did you really? The good part. Okay, so let me briefly, briefly remind you of the dramatic development in Western culture at that time, around 1900. Uh, the, new, uh, the need for new ways of seeing and understanding reality and the rejection of old values. Um, in science, very briefly, just, I just want to create the mise-en-scene. In, in science, we got Darwin's book on natural selection in 1859. The ether was disproved in, 18, in the 1880s in, by Michelson and Morley. Uh, Charcot in Paris and Freud in Vienna were tinkering with the subconscious. Einstein published his theory of special relativity in 1905. The Wright brothers engineered sustained controlled flight in 1903. Um, in painting, uh, in the late 19th century, we see realism and impressionism. The three decades from 1890 to 1920 bring a revolution in literature, music, architecture, and painting. We have lots of isms uh, in art. We have fauvism, symbolism, cubism, orphism, German expressionism, Russian con constructivism, Italian futurism, um, and what was it you mentioned? Surrealism, surrealism yes, surrealism. Um, uh, Stravinsky's Firebird uh, premiered in 1910. You heard a bit of it earlier. Uh, we had James Joyce, we had Virginia Woolf, and naturalism in the theater. In architecture, which is our first topic, in architecture we went from this to this. Wow. So we'll get back to some of that. Um, the dramatic change was brought about in many, uh, by many architects and designers. In Holland, there was the, the steel. In Switzerland, Le Corbusier. In Austria, the Secession. And in Germany, the Bauhaus, which was linked to an organization called the German Workers Association. The change seems abrupt, but there were rumblings already in the mid-19th century. The Bauhaus architects and designers were influenced by the English arts and crafts movement, where William Morris, that's one of his designs, 
Uh, William Morris was the most influential thinker. Um, William Morris was a medievalist, hung out with the pre raphaelite painters, and married, you've seen her, uh, Jane Burden. Uh, here she's painted by Dante Gabriele Rossetti, a uh, pre raphaelite So William Morris went to see the exposition uh, at the Crystal Palace in London in 1851. And that's the painting we have by Pissarro of the Crystal Palace. You can see it on the left there. That's 1851, and he was horrified by what he saw. The Industrial Revolution had made it possible to mass produce machine made furniture, rugs, for household objects, uh, wallpaper, etc., without any sense of design or craftsmanship, just to make money. Furniture was built out of cheap pine and then veneered with mahogany. Morris didn't just find these objects ugly, but immoral. Living with such deceptive veneers and overwrought ornamentation, he felt, had a negative effect on the morals of people who lived with them. Well, that's what, I mean, he was into this. Uh, if people lived with honestly crafted furniture, wallpaper, teapots, etc., they would become more moral. So let me just remind you what the Victorians uh, lived with. <laughs> these are images. I, uh, we have these objects at the Art Institute. Nice, huh? All right, now, not this. This is arts and crafts. Um, so the arts and crafts movement to, uh, took hold in America, too, and what I'm showing here is the interior of the Gamble House by Green and Green in Pasadena, uh, built in 1909. So the arts and crafts movement put out a publication called The New House, which appeared in Germany as Das Neue Haus. Morris's connection between morality and design was much discussed among German artisans and architects. How do you implement this notion of the moral influence of well-crafted objects? Well, you start a school of design and you call it Das Bauhaus. All right, there it is, Bauhaus. Um, the Bauhaus was the brainchild of an architect named Walter Gropius. Now, imagine it's Central Europe 1919, you're in a country devastated and bankrupted by war, and you want to promote the idea that moral behavior will come about if you give people cleanly, honestly designed objects for their everyday life. And you do this in Weimar, which was proud of its history. It's where Goethe and Schiller worked out their part in the Enlightenment in the late 18th century. They were not welcome, the Bauhaus people. So the Bauhaus uh, started as a school of design and architecture was added um, a bit later. Walter Gropius attracted the now celebrated modernists um, like um, in the early years, um, like Feininger, Kandinsky, hello, hello. Okay, this is Clay. This is Maholi Nodge, Joseph Albers, and a mystical Swiss named Johannes Itten, who investigated the psychology of color. Um, they had no money, grew their own vegetables in the yard, had no furniture, sat on the floor with a pile of newspapers as uh, art supplies, as art material. Like here's some newspapers, scissors and glue, make a teapot, design a new chair. And uh, speaking of chairs, well, we just had a, an exhibit opening at the Art Institute of, of, of Modern Chairs, opened yesterday. So, so here are some, um, some of the chairs that came out of, um, out of the Bauhaus approach. This is the Bruno chair, the Vasily chair by uh, Marcel Breuer, and another uh, Marcel Breuer chair called the Cessna and by a Dutch designer named uh, Mart Stam. Uh, this is a cantilever chair. I mean, this is all very early. This is in the 20s we're doing this kind of thing. 
And just to be fair, uh, Le Corbusier, who uh, was not at the Bauhaus, but he worked with Mies, and he was of the same philosophy. Um, oh, here, here they are. This is Corbusier with his pipe, and then there's um, Mies with the spats. You can see he's wearing spats. Um, and uh, speaking of chairs, this is his famous Barcelona chair. And this is my caricature of Mies. <laughs> on, his, on his great chair. He was sort of a pontificator, you know, and he was very high. Uh, his famous uh, saying is, less is more. His biographer, Franz Schulze, who uh, lives uh, up here in Lake Forest, said that Mies came up with these inscrutable expressions because he didn't speak English very well. <laughs> Uh, in 1927, at the, uh, Mies was at the time a co-director co of the German Workers' Association. He headed a team of 17 international architects who designed 33 um, state-of-the-art high-tech buildings comprising 63 apartments. Um, it was called the Weissenhof Estate, just outside Stuttgart. It was put together from prefabricated elements and took only five months to build. It was planned as affordable, dignified, clean, healthy worker housing, but ran into cost overruns. It was too expensive for workers who did not want to live there anyway. This architecture appealed only to progressive thinking artists and intellectuals. Uh, the city could have come up Oh, sorry, this is Barcelona. Um, the city could have come up with the money to entice workers to move in, but bus drivers and seamstresses did not want to live in such un unadorned buildings. Uh, we can come back to this theme if we have time uh, when we talk about skyscrapers in Chicago and the development of the early skyscrapers down at Dearborn and Jackson and so forth. So by 1927... Um, the same year as Weissenhof, Mies was so highly respected that he was chosen to design the German pavilion in the World Exposition held in Barcelona. Uh, we've already seen his chair, there you are, which was designed for that exposition. Uh, Mies was the last director of the Bauhaus, which had moved to Berlin, where in 1933 it was closed by the Nazis, of course. In the 30s, in that bankrupt country, um, building commissions uh, dried up, but Mies, in 37, got a commission to design a residence in Wyoming, and so he moved to the United States to work on that project, and then he accepted an invitation to teach in Chicago at IIT, where he designed 20 buildings on the campus from 1939 to 1958. And this is his fabulous crown hall. This is the architecture building. Uh, it's absolutely stunning. Have, have, has anybody seen this in the flesh? the The roof is actually, the roof is actually, the roof is actually held is actually suspended from those two main structures, and it's a clear space throughout. Two of uh, Two of Mises' uh, students uh, at IIT, uh, Schipperwright and Heinrich, designed Lake Point Tower. In 1968, in homage to the master, uh, who had a design for Berlin in 1921, looking like this. It was all curtained glass walls. But of course, at that time, it couldn't be built because of the political mess and the financial mess. Um, Mies also designed with Philip Johnson the Seagram Building in New York on nine, in 1958. But uh, I want to concentrate on what we have in Chicago by Mies. So this is what went up on Lake, uh, Lakeshore Drive uh, around 1950. I think they were finished in 1951. Uh, Lakeshore Drive, um, 18, I'm sorry, 860 to 880, and then 900 to 910. But let uh, this is what it looked like. Can you imagine 1950, these, these iron skeletons going up, and they were going to be clothed in glass curtain walls. So let's, uh, let's focus in on some of the principles that are operating in this architecture. 
This is, of course, the uh, Federal Center, um, which um, uh, went up uh, between 1964 and 1974. Uh, so, what are the principles at the heart of this architecture? Uh, I think I have five listed, five. Art should be part of its age, and architecture should be part of its age. Mies saw himself creating a new architectural language that would rep represent the new era of technology and production. By the late 19th century, we were definitely living in the machine age with new technology being developed constantly, trains, telephones, the elevator, internal combustion engine, etc. The Bauhaus philosophy said that our residences, our housing, um, so this gets us a little bit back to this kind of thing. Uh, our, our housing should also be designed like, well, like factories. Um, they should be efficient with easy maintenance. Good light and ventilation would foster good health. All right. So, um, Austrian architect Adolf Loos uh, said, "Ornament is sin." <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, there would be no ornamentation um, because ornament implies greater expense and that implies social hierarchy. So down with the class system. Hello? <laughs> well, I am too. Um, so, um, so down with the class system, it's easy to see the moral implication of this. Architecture says, this architecture says, we're all equal. Um, thirdly, a fundamental dictum in Bauhaus architecture is, and that's this, truth to material. Don't build something in humble brick and then cover it up in opulent marble. Instead, show the structure, the steel that actually holds up the walls. Steel had been invented in the uh, late 18th century uh, actually, two guys came out with it, Bessemer in England and Kelly in Kentucky. Um, and had, uh, So steel had been used in bridges uh, very early, but it wasn't until the late 19th century that it was used in buildings. And the first skyscraper, skyscraper went up right here in Chicago. And next point, um, there was, would be no grandeur in the entrance. Right? If you think of the old Victorian buildings, the entrance is this great portal. Behold, you're entering into this edifice. We don't have that in, uh, in uh, Miesian architecture, in modern architecture. The door is really nothing. Uh, it's often hard to find. It's not, right? It's not self-congratulatory. It's not grand. It's not a portal. It's just this is where you enter. Um, and the floor covering uh, is the same outside as inside. So there's an effortless flow from uh, outside to inside between nature and artificial structure. <clears throat> the Bauhaus uh, architects um, and artists were convinced that their art uh, was deeply moral and would bring about a deeper sense of community and equality. And here are more shots of the Federal Plaza because I just love it. Look at this. And that uh, on the left behind it, the fourth wall of the Federal Plaza is the Manhattan Building, which is from the first Chicago School of Architecture from the 1890s and is very restrained in its ornamentation. So Mies planned it out so that he would have this conversation between the second school, which is what his architecture is called, the second school of architecture, Chicago Architecture, and the first. It's very, very wonderful. Now... This is the Inland Steel Building, uh, which went up in 1956. First building to go up in the loop uh, after the, the war, during which time there was nothing built. It is completely clad in stainless steel, which was the one form of steel that the company, Inland Steel, did not produce. <laughs> but it was so important to them to project this flawless, clean, simple, pure, progressive look that they went to Sweden to buy the stainless steel at great expense. Okay, so 
uh, here, this is uh, something very contemporary. I ran across this page in a design magazine recently. Uh, can you make out the phrase, Max Lamb makes simple, honest furniture? Can you see that? Okay. Okay, so here you have, you have the conjunction of simple and honest. Get it? Simple and honest. So this, this notion... Um, this notion, uh, this association between simplicity of design and morality, right, which is honesty, is now anchored. It's anchored in our culture. Yes? All right, let's move on to Picasso. Hmm, where am I? Ah, yes. No. Where are you, Jay? Excuse me. Oh, darn. Ah, wait. Take your time. No, 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 no. Ah, voila. I see. All right, Picasso said, art is war. This painting is Picasso's response to the bombing of Guernica, a Basque village in northern Spain at the end of April in 1937. As the most famous Spanish artist living in France, Picasso had been commissioned to provide artworks for the International Exposition in Paris, which was to open in June that year. He had been working on one of his favorite themes, the artist and his muse, but, hello? What happened? What happened? I don't have the slightest idea, right? Oh, it's right here. Uh -huh. It's always just plug okay. it in, yeah. Um, so he was, uh, he was planning on, on using uh, artworks relating to this f favorite theme of his, uh, the artist and his muse. But when Guernica was bombed, he knew immediately that Guernica had to be his theme. The painting is 26 feet long and was completed in four weeks, uh, starting with initial sketches in time to be installed in June at the Spanish Pavilion in the Paris Exposition. Pablo Ruiz Picasso was born in 1881 in Malaga in southern Spain. His father was an art professor who moved his family to Barcelona in the north when Picasso was 14. Um, Picasso enrolled in the art academy there. He had two, here are two examples of the work he did at the age of 14. This is a, a pastel study of his mother. Um, this is a, a sort of a genre painting. It's called Science and Charity. Um, this is a, at the age of 14. You can see he has mastered anatomy, lighting, perspective, everything. Uh, this is what he looked like when he was 15. And this is a life study he made at the age of 15. So clearly, he could have become famous and wealthy as a portrait painter of the rich had he chosen that career. Alas, he was an anarchist. <laughs> he probably did not attend his classes much at the Art Academy. He drew and painted uh, independently and he frequented a cafe called El Cuatro Gats, the Four Cats, which was the gathering place of anarchist writers and artists who were his friends, many of them 10 and 20 years older than he. Anarchism 
took root in Catalonia, um, Barcelona, around 1860. Barcelona became a hotbed of anarchism, which is an ideology that was anti-church and anti-government. How did that happen? At the beginning of the 19th century, the feudal rights on land in Spain had been abolished. And starting with 1855, these lands, both civil and ecclesiastical, were sold on the open market. The Catholic Church supported the government's subsequent suppression of the peasants' revolt. Of course, only the rich could buy up the land. The peasants were deprived of shelter, their livelihood, and swarmed into the city. In Barcelona, when Picasso was a young man in his teens, the streets were crowded with homeless people, beggars, and desperate women. This is Picasso in his teens. Barcelona already had a long history of anti-clericalism and a sense of separateness from the rest of Spain. The government in Madrid was corrupt. Elections were rigged in favor of politicians who supported the rich. The status of working people was appalling. Um, Barcelona in the 1890s had a population of about a half a million. The textile mills employed 50,000 women at half the wages that men got which was already pittance, and 30,000 children at half the wages of women. The rich and powerful apparently were not appalled by this. Slavery was acceptable to Spaniards of that time. They owned Cuba, where slavery was not abolished until 1898, when Spain lost the Spanish-American War. How did the rich in Barcelona live? and they went to the opera. The first anarchist bomb was thrown in 1891, and in 1893, two bombs were thrown, the last at a performance of Rossini's William Tell. Um, the Barcelonese loved Italian opera and adored Wagner. They were culturally oriented to the north, celebrating not only German composers and writers, but shopping for fashion in London and Paris. This is what they liked. This is Ar Nouveau, uh, which the, in Spanish is El Modernismo. We have all these things at the Art Institute. Uh, this is also the time that Gaudí's Sagrada Familia was going up. It's still going up. They, they hope to get it finished by, uh, by Gaudí's death, uh, centenary of his death in uh, 2026. And Picasso thought this was silly. This is him. Catalonian artists made a practice of spending a few months every year painting in Paris. Santiago Rusignol and Ramon Casas who were both much older, who were both, what did I do again? Did I do something? Oh. Um, who were much older, um, like uh, Rusignol was 20 years older than Picasso and he was a close friend. Um, uh, they, uh, they were both, Casas and Rusignol were both from uh, wealthy families. They stayed in Paris regularly. Um, and Picasso, who was middle class but not well off, also took short trips uh, to Paris to study the art scene there. I think I've lost this. I'm okay? I'm just fine. Um, so he took short trips uh, to, to Paris, uh, which was the art capital of Europe at the time. And this is Casas's portrait of him when he was 19. This is Picasso at 19, drawn by Ramon Casas. Uh, and he finally, uh, Picasso finally settle, settled in Paris in 1904. So uh, this is him in 1904. This practice of Spanish artists uh, coming to Paris was so common that there was a Spanish colony there that supported newcomers and introduced them to the galleries and agents. Um, so this is also the time, just very briefly to put this in context, um, of 
in Prussianism, right? They were struggling to get shown. This is our, this is our Monet's at the Art Institute. But what the Parisians really loved in the 1890s was this. <laughs> and Gustave Moreau, right? Oedipus and the Sphinx. And this is also Oedipus and the Sphinx, but this is by Eng, I-N-G-R-E-S, Eng. Anger is a little earlier in the century, but French adored Eng. Now, I also cannot get enough of Eng, so I'm going to show you a whole lot of Eng because I think it's very funny. Um, to me, his paintings look like satires. Um, like, really, come on, really. Uh, but I've never come across an art historian who who saw satire in this. Um, I just, look at this. Will you please look at this? <laughs> I mean, this is lovely, right? But um, this is at the Frick in, in, um, in Manhattan. And when you see the blue, the blue is so blue, you just fall into this painting. But her right arm is not attached to anything. Her right arm comes out of her rib cage and then and then it sits there on her stomach like a dead fish. It is so wonderful. And the reflection in the glass couldn't possibly be the reflection. I mean, but uh, pe people adore this stuff. The eyes turned heavenward. Oh, come on, right? Okay, so... This, this I really, this is Monsieur Bertin, who was wealthy and he was a critic. So he, you know, so Ang did a number on him. So this actually is, is wonderful. Now, okay, uh, let's, uh, let's get back to Picasso. Still in his teens, what did his art look like and, and, and his anarchist friends, what were they doing? What did his anarchist art look like? So this is um, uh, Rossignol and Casas, whom I mentioned before, were only marginally anarchist and preferred to paint their own social class, which was high, and they were, but they were also sympathetic to the anarchist cause. So this is Roussignol's drawings of anarchists who were condemned and executed. And this is uh, Ramon Casas's painting from 1894 of the execution of that opera bomber that I mentioned. Now, Anarchism in Barcelona in the 1890s did not only mean lawlessness and violence, yes, there were strikes and bombs were thrown, but anarchism had an intellectual utopian underpinning, which came primarily from Kropotkin and Nietzsche. Uh, Peter Kropotkin, uh, 1842 to 1921, was a Russian aristocrat, his title was Prince, who turned against his class. He was highly respected as a geologist, and he also theorized um, about a better world in the social and political sense. Uh, and he wrote numerous books and pamphlets. Needless to say, he was exiled from Russia and spent most of his life in France and England, where he wrote his influential books. Kropotkin believed all would be peace if people were allowed to associate with one another in small groups according to their interests and talents. These, <clears throat> these small societies would bring out the best in everybody and there would be peace. Uh, there would be no national borders. War comes from the formation of states, which must have borders, and borders cause wars. Kropotkin's view, in Kropotkin's view, artists played an important role in this revolution. Um, he instructed artists to reject being rewarded by the bourgeoisie and boldly to show the world as it is. He told artists that they were played, uh, that they played an important essential role in changing human consciousness and in moving it forward. Here's a quote um, he said to the artists. He said, place your pen, your pencil, your chisel, your ideas at the service of the revolution. Show the people how hideous is their actual life and place your hands on the causes of its ugliness. Uh, 
The other um, major intellectual influence came from Nietzsche. Um, and uh, um, uh, one close friend of Picasso's, Pompeo Guiner, and this is Picasso's portrait of Pompeo Guiner. Um, uh, Pompeo Guiner translated Nietzsche, uh, although there had been previous translations by the great uh, Catalonian poet Juan Maragall, but this was more immediate, and he was of that generation. Uh, and he popularized um, Guiner, popularized the writ writings of uh, Nietzsche in Barcelona. So it's safe to assume that since Guiner was a friend of of Picasso's, that Picasso read Nietzsche as a teenager. So uh, Nietzsche's uh, idea of the Übermensch is not about political power, but refers to the individual, especially the artist, who has to transform himself to overcome his past and create himself anew. Nietzsche said um, uh, man is suspended between his superstitious monkey mind past and his enlightened self-aware future. Nietzsche sees the individual as an, sees the artist as an individual. This is Picasso's self-portrait of 1901. He's now 20 years old. And there's actually an inscription there, which is barely legible here, that says, yo, yo, Picasso. Yo means I, right? So here he is in this white sort of smock-like voluminous shirt and this, uh, this outrageous flamboyant orange tie, very assertive, I, Picasso. And in Spain, yo, um, I, became a catchword for this Nietzschean assertion of the individual. The anarchists put out numerous periodicals. Uh, they were against art for art's sake, which is also one of the movements, like with Whist Whistler in England, um, art for art's sake, they uh, rejected that and, and insisted that art had to be um, engaged. And Picasso himself and a friend of his edited a publication of texts and illustrations called Arte Hoen, which means young art. Another close friend of, uh, of Picasso's was Isidre Nonel, and here are some works um, by Isidre Nonel. close friend of Picasso's, right? This is Picasso now. Uh, some works by Picasso, a, a very young Picasso. He's 17, 18, 19 years old. Actually, this one was done in Paris, but he kept going back and forth between Barcelona and Paris. So Picasso clearly thinks that this is worth this is worth looking at. These people are worth looking at. He is definitely an engaged artist. Uh, throughout his life, uh, drinking absinthe. Um, throughout his life, uh, Picasso was actually quite sociable, and he drew his friends. And here are some of the some of the friends um, that he drew. Actually, he's in there. The second, the second one down. That's that's him, on the left, in the middle. Um, a much uh, quite a caricaturist, isn't he? Yeah. Okay, you recognize this, right? We have this at the Art Institute, 1910. Uh, this is Picasso's dealer, Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, um, who uh, who was painted here in 1910 in the Cubist manner. Um, when they were both old men, um, Kahnweiler said that Picasso was the most unpolitical person he had ever known. Well, Picasso was not political in the sense of understanding political strategy, but he was concerned about how politics affects the freedom of the individual. There's evidence that Picasso was very much concerned with social issues and war. In 1912, 1913, he made over 80 collages, and uh, half of them contained newspaper texts, many about the Balkan Wars of 1912. And I only showed two of them. This is one, and this is the other. So, um, 
The newspaper clippings are about reports of events with special political meaning, and they were carefully cut out to preserve the legibility, and sometimes whole columns of print remained intact. Now, all you're seeing here is the guitar and the music and the wallpaper. Um, but he is politically engaged as an anarchist, very much in 1912-13, still very much an anarchist artist. He's subverting the art of the rich, which is the high art of oil painting. I mean, this is humble stuff. You're just gluing stuff together by introducing such easily readable articles on war and suffering. So I, can you make out the text at the bottom? Uh, part of it says Le Journal, and, uh, or, or Le Jour, whatever that newspaper was called. And then there's a, um, a headline, La Bataille s'est engagée. Can you make that out? Which means the battle is now engaged. The battle has started. And, and, and the continuation of the article actually is about a, a battle on the Balkans. And this is, Suze is a, an aperitif, um, but the text, the text is a description of corpses on the battlefield. Picasso's closest friends uh, joined the army in 1914, particularly Braque and Apollinaire. Both came back with head wounds. Apollinaire, uh, who was his friend and was the anarchist poet, um, had become a French citizen. He was born Polish so that he could enlist in the French army. Uh, Apollinaire uh, said of uh, Picasso that he was, that Picasso was reordering the universe. And with the beginning of war, even Kropotkin, the arch anarchist went crazy, um, just lost all perspective and all the anarchist uh, devotion. So Kropotkin, now an old man, publicized his fears of the German threat to civilization and encouraged everyone to join the army, which would have been unthinkable in the 1890s. With his friends at the front, Picasso was persuaded to work with Diaghilev, who needed modern art for the backdrops of his modern ballets. And in 1917, Picasso, who liked collaborating with other, other art artists, went to Rome to work with dancers and composers. Here he met the ballerina, Olga Koklova, who was a Russian lower rank, but nevertheless aristocrat. Uh, so Picasso's friends, um, uh, changed, his circle of friends changed, and his art changed. He married her, by the way. Okay, so. But in the spring of 1937, at the age of 56, he raged against war uh, and suffering as he had done in his teens in Barcelona. Picasso died in April 1973. This is his last self-portrait. Well, in conclusion, um, we can go back to some of this, obviously, but in conclusion, I invite you to take time to look at the paintings that we have here in the meeting room. Um, the work is abstract and produced by a group of painters who meet at the Evanston Art Center. Technically, it's a class with me as the instructor, but I regard everyone as a colleague. Modernist painting, a modernist painting will lead you into your imagination at its deepest, most inventive level. When you see the inventiveness of your imagination, you'll find yourself having a profound but banal sounding influence, I mean insight, which is this. We make things up. Yo, yo Picasso. I as an individual, I invent my life. I'm, I make choices, I try to live honestly. 
And this quest for clarity, individuality, and morality is at the heart of modernism. My question is, with all of the wonderful intentions of the Bauhaus and uh, the, uh, the pure morality and uh, the uh, desire to make uh, all these uh, ideals universal, do you, do you believe that the working class perceived them as intellectuals and were alienated by what they perceived as an elitism, and uh, hence uh, the the rise of the Nazi Party uh, uh, was more popular among the workers. Well, I um, I would hesitate to. Uh, I, mean, I can't. I can't get into that depth of the psychology of the worker and link the elitism uh, of the Bauhaus with the rise of Nazism. That's, uh, that would take quite a bit of working out. I, I can't really do that. But it's clear that, they, that the workers did not want to live in these houses. Yeah, um, that was the intention. I mean, Mies was the vice president of the German Workers Association, the whole drive in that was to to provide clean, dignified, healthy housing, you know, um, that would be easily maintained so that you wouldn't have to have servants, right? Um, um, but, um, well, what is the psychology here? People want to be linked to their past. And some, when something is radically new, it can be frightening. We, and they did not want to live in them. They did not want to live in these, uh, in these cleanly designed buildings. Did the, um, right here. Did the um, architects, well, Mies, for example, in the entire school, did they have something to say about how the interiors of the, either the, well, I worked in one of the office buildings uh, <laughs> that, that he designed, uh, you know, within the last, you know, whatever, 20 years. Um, obviously, extremely uh, boring. And so I'm just wondering whether the, um, whether the architects had anything to say about the furnishings. Uh, well, indeed, just the, the interior, how the interior was to be arranged. They designed chairs, right? We saw that. We saw their chairs designed. Um, the int I think that people who would choose a building like that would also choose, they would not put in Victorian furniture, <laughs> except for, of the kind that we saw, uh, except for uh, sort of contrast and kind of wit, uh, use of wit. Um, and... Um, we know, we know, for example, Frank Lloyd Wright, right? Frank Lloyd Wright was not a, a Miesian. Um, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Do you know the people who designed the Sears Tower and the Hancock? Um, Frank Lloyd Wright called them Skidding's own more and sterile. Um, but, but Frank Lloyd Wright was famous for uh, designing the interior, uh, the furniture, not only that, but the gowns of the woman who lived in the house. The Roby, Mrs. Roby wore Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, design house. So he was very much in control. But um, are you saying you didn't find the furniture comfortable? Where's, who, it, was a, it was a federal courthouse. The, court court the Dirksen, the Dirksen courthouse? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, and the, was, and the, it, chairs, it, the chairs were not comfortable? was just, from what I remember, extremely standard issue. I mean, I just think... Oh, I'm sorry. They ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> it's a government building, albeit a federal court. Well, that could be. But, I mean, the chairs are, are very comfortable and very interesting, right? Okay. 
So you thought it was boring. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> but see, the principles, if you just understand the principles, that would be exciting. Yeah? But, uh, my take is that the simple worker does not want to be put in a plain box while the capitalists live in the nice places. So there's no real equality being established there. There's being a distinction between the worker who lives in a plain box and the betters who live in the nicer boxes. Well, we disagree. Well, um, box, you know, I know. This is what the buildings are called, the box. Um, Mies designed, uh, designed a house for um, his woman companion. We don't know what their relationship really was. The Farnsworth house out in Plano, which truly is a glass box, and it's elevated because it's in a floodplain. It's six feet off the ground, and it's all glass encased. Or Philip Johnson, his, his glass house in New Canaan, Connecticut. Um, um, you can call them a glass box, but you see what happens when you have glass walls is that you are not in a building. Do you understand? Yeah, you're, complete, you're completely surrounded by... Those were not glass. Those, the ones we saw were the workers rejected. They rejected them not because of some ties to the past and the history of their architecture, but because they were plain boxes for workers. Well, now, if they had multiple levels of society moving into those places, that might have been different. That might have moved more toward equality if the bosses lived there as well as the workers, if the owners lived there but as well as the pets. Well... I mean, theoretically, you could. I, does anybody know what the rent is at 8, 860 Lakeshore Drive? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, has, it has become elitist, right? To, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the intention was to have it, it's easily built with prefabricated elements going out quickly, um, easy to maintain. You don't need servants. It's very clean. And people... It takes a certain intellectual level to find that appealing. There's an idea behind it. Yes. Exactly. And even though, you know, the, the furniture I showed, um, you know, the, the Victorian furniture, we, we, you know, we in this room, we kind of snicker at that. But, but people like that because it anchors them in their past. And thinking progressively is difficult. If you have a job driving a bus or whatever you're doing, that it becomes it's difficult to 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 think that way. You want the comfort of the past, such as it was. Past had its problems. You may you may think about that. Okay. Um. So, but yes, I mean, yes, they, the offices are all the same. Okay, so let me see. Um, in in the in the older architecture in Chicago, um, where's my um, blah, 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 blah. oh? I think this is the old colony. Okay. All right. We're getting this picture. It's coming up. All right, the old colony. Um, on South Dearborn, this was built in the uh, 1890s. Now, this is a skyscraper, which means it could be it could be a, a glass curtain wall, right? Because it because the walls are not holding this thing up. Um, this is a building that's held up by internal skeleton of iron and steel. But in the 1890s, that was problematic. <laughs> This could look like this could look like a Mesian glass tower, but people couldn't believe that, and they wouldn't go up in a building like that. It didn't look secure enough, and it didn't have not only that, but it didn't have the polite Renaissance quotations from the past, which which reassured them. So you have to have a dental frieze, and you have a little ornamentation, and you have the, the bay window. See the bay window? Okay. You still have a hierarchy indicated here because the, the bosses would want the corner office, right? 
the corner office has that. Whereas in, in the Mesian building, the corner office is it's nothing. It's just like everything else. Right? It doesn't have a special pizzazz to it. So, so the, the psychology of this is, is, is very, very interesting. Um, okay, this is the Fisher building, um, uh, also fr from around uh, 1890. Uh, now, the Fisher building is a skyscraper. It's, it looks like, like this, uh, this, this, you see the, the iron structure, that's from the L. That's what the building looks like inside. That's what's holding it up. And so the wall, the wall doesn't have to be anything. It just has to keep the rain and the wind out, which means it can be glass. But you had to have, you had to have doodads on it. You had to have, you had to have ornamentation on it because, because that's what we do, right? This is shows shows that we have a sense of our tradition, our, and we're polite, and we're not just being a radical and doing something new. Oh, this is a building where you have the CNN building. Do you see the red structure in the back? So the Fisher building could look like that. Not that you want to. I mean, they painted it red, which is a little problem. But but you had you had to you had to have these uh, this ornamentation. So the transition, the psychological transition, was something you had to realize. Anybody else? Oh, question. Uh, question here. Um, I was struck in that early portrait of Picasso called Yo, how much he looked like Prince, at least from where I'm sitting. <laughs> um, but my question is, um, back in the 60s I saw Gaudí's Sagrada, and that, it was unfinished then, and it's been a half century since. So I'm wondering how much has been accomplished since then. Well, they're working on it. They're trying. Uh, um, it was only a quarter finished. It was started in 1882. And, uh, and, and uh, by the time Gaudi died in, in 1926, uh, it was only a quarter finished, whatever that means, because he didn't really have a, a detailed plans, you understand, right? He had to do some, do some of this over here and put a turtle over here and a she cell over here. Um, but he didn't, uh, he, it's not like architecture where you have a blueprint and you follow the blueprint. So they're trying to, to get it done. Uh, they've run out of money. Uh, the Sagrada Familia was not a church project. It was not funded by the uh, Catholic Church. It was funded by a very, very fundamentalist Catholic uh, club, uh, an organization. They raised the money, and then eventually they ran out of money. And now the city is in this fix because the Sagrada Familia is what draws the Japanese uh, tourists. And, and all the other tourists. It is, it is why you go to Barcelona to see the Sagrada Familia. So they have to come up the, with the money to finish it. It's kind of a... Yes? Did I get at your question? But I'm glad you made the, the whole thing relevant by bringing in print. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on... I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why Nietzsche is so closely associated with Nazism and Hitler when it seems like his actual philosophy was completely the opposite. That's you know, right. That it was about individuality That's right. and not following the herd mentality and kind of being a trailblazer in your own right, breaking with the past. But now, when we hear the Ubermensch, it's been completely turned on its head. I, right. I'm it's just curious what your thoughts are. Well, it's completely perverted. That's right. Nietzsche is not easy to read. Um, and um, if, you're in, if you have a society which is bankrupt and, right, I mean, in, in the 20s, um, inflation was... Ridiculous. Uh, they used to have st a stamp would cost a million marks uh, in the morning. And then in the afternoon, inflation had made the value or the price of the stamp one and a half million. And they didn't have time to print new stamps. So they crossed out the one million and put in one and a half million for a postage stamp. So this is the kind of chaos you had in the society. And in those circumstances, people are not going to go and read Nietzsche 
and, and really parse out what, what he's actually saying about how um, man, right? Man, human beings have to transcend themselves. We have to, we have to become better people. We have to become individuals and responsible for ourselves. So the the people did not read Nietzsche, and then he was uh, he was used for propaganda because he also talked about power. Right, it's one of his words is power, but he didn't mean political power. He despised all of the other governments. He despised his contemporaries and how they thought. Um, power had to do with individual power, which meant self-realization. Yeah. Hi. I, you mentioned you used the phrase art for art's sake. And it seems that there's almost like opposite philosophies. Art for art's sake or art that must be socially significant. Right. And it seems there's a, a clash there. There are many other uh, reasons for why artists create what they do. But that seems to be like two almost uh, antagonistic or certainly very different points of view as to the purpose of right. art. Right, uh, exactly. Yeah. Art, art for art's sake was a phrase that was uh, used around this time too. Uh, Whistler is a famous representative. And, um, and Art Nouveau is, is sort of, is, is our, you remember the images? I'm not sure I can come up with them. Art Nouveau is also that. Uh, a play on forms, right? Do you remember the images? Okay. Oh, here. here. Okay, wait. A oh, I lost it again. Um, a play on on images. Uh, a play on forms, and and uh, and it's not political uh, at all. Whereas engaged art, which is the, the term that would be used, um, so Art Nouveau. Uh, I, well, engaged art is has a social conscience and really wants to bring about a change. Um, and engaged art tends to focus on on uh, on the people who are not looked at, right? Who are not visible, who are the poor. And I showed you all of those images of uh, of the destitute in Barcelona. That was very courageous of them to actually make art like that. But, you know, you, there, art, what is art? I mean, what is art? I'm not going to define it, but there are some things that need to be looked at. And what you look at has a lot to do with, with your consciousness. If you're looking at Art Nouveau, that's what you think is worth looking at. If you're looking at the images of the, uh, of the poor, um, then you're saying, this is worth looking at. The beggars in the street. I mean, he could have done. He could have. He could have painted the rich, but he thought the beggars in the street were worth looking at. This is what we need to look at. You mentioned earlier that uh, one of the ideologies, for want of a better term, of the Bauhaus school was that um, building housing for the poor on uh, their uh, model, uh, design-wise, uh, would uh, help to lift the poor out of poverty. Now, the CHA projects, now defunct, uh, some say were inspired by the ideas of Le Corbusier, and uh, of course, they didn't accomplish that goal at all. Uh, do you know of... Uh, Housing for the poor anywhere in the world built um, or based on this vision of the Bauhaus that uh, succeeded in accomplishing this? They, uh, this architecture, this simplified uh, architecture is um, seen all over Eastern Europe, for example, and also in, uh, in Germany and France. Um, And it, 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 it works if you have the um, if you have the necessary sort of social work that goes with it, because um, um, 
no, Carl Sandburg Village, right? On, where is it, on LaSalle? And near Goethe, Schiller? There. That's a high rise, and people live in their apartments there. And uh, it's not known for, for crime. And uh, if you have the same architecture and people are, are in there who have social issues, or, um, then you're going to have problems. So the, 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 the high rises like that have to be accompanied by a, a social structure, by, by social work that helps people who live in there. And if that's overlooked, then, then you, you get pruitt Eigel, you know, which is torn down and so forth. Okay, we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, <clears throat> there seems to be a question of perception. So ornamentation, jewelry, art, all these things that aren't really practical but are just decoration um, are perceived as costing money. So as a product of uh, the mid-century modern where all the de decoration was being taken off and that's part of Mises thing, um, is now having a resurgence I understand because I put, I put out a mid-century modern couch on my curb and it was gone within four minutes and my son has been berating me. I didn't realize that, you know, this whole thing has come back. But um, how do you get people that don't have extra to perceive that not having extra is better than having extra? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and mid-century modern is very Miesian. I don't know what your couch looked like. Yeah. But it's not just simple and cheap. It's well-constructed and therefore expensive. That's right. We're just getting started here. Well, can you stay for coffee hours so I people can, can. I can. continue the discussion?